Mura sama from Terraria Calamity Mod has received a brand new complete rework along with a lot of other weapons. So in this video, I'll be playing Terraria Calamity Mod, but I start with a level 1 rework Murasama. Along the way, I will also be showing you guys other weapons that got reworked by the Calamity Overhaul mod, just to make things a bit more interesting. First, let me explain on what changed with the Murasama before we start this journey. To put things short, it basically scales with our progression now. It starts off weak, but as we progress and defeat bosses, the damage increases and we'll be able to unlock special combos that only the Murasama can unleash. For every subscriber this video gets, I will take 50 dirt blocks in Terraria. What could possibly go wrong? Enjoy the video! Unlike other playthroughs, we start inside a box near the Dreadon Lab in the underworld biome. Our mission here is to dig down to infiltrate the Dreadon base. There are two turrets down here that will destroy us immediately if we are not careful. To avoid that from happening, I rush to the right side after dropping. We still took one to red shot, but it's better than dying. Now we mine down the turret from below and open one of the two chests here. Inside of it, it is the one and only beloved Murasama. And yep, I am not reading all that. Currently, it only deals 10 damage, but it still gets the job done. I'd rather use this than copper short sword any day of the week. Not long afterwards, we commit toaster in a bathtub, so that we could go back to spawn. Also, notice how the rework Murasama gained a new projectile attack. It might look weak now, but it will get better as we progress. Now we must do the usual, like committing deforestation, build some prison boxes for our NPCs to move in, and make a small arena, the obligatory early game shenanigans. After that, I explored the cave near our base. It is much easier to explore the caves now due to the lighting provided from our Murasama. I obtained a hermit's boots from one of the chests. While we are near the source of lava and water, I also gathered some obsidians, just in case we need them for later. Inside the cave, I found a glowing mushroom biome, in which I got some decent loot and a bone pickaxe. Then I went back to base, crafted an obsidian skull, an iron anvil, and an amethyst hook. Afterwards, I drank a gravitation potion, in hope of getting some decent sky island loot. Well, I didn't get much stuff, other than getting by a group of harpies. Let's just explore the underground caves again for now. We mined down a lot of gold ores, defeated some enemies for materials, and finally we get the thing we were looking for, a cloud in a bottle. We go back to base and craft a full set of gold armor for some protection. Then I drank a gravitation potion again. Things were going well, only for us to get destroyed by the harpies once again. Eventually, after going through like 5 sky islands, we finally found a shiny red balloon. Now we must go to the corruption biome. The recoil from Murasama helps us to move faster. We fall into the pit of corruption and craft a slime crown on the demon altar. While we are here, might as well destroy two orbs, getting a musket and a shadow ball pet. Let's wait for daytime before summoning king slime. In the meantime, let's explore a bit of the desert biome. In here, we found a pyramid, which had a topaz hook inside of the loot chest. What's the point of crafting an amethyst hook earlier then? While waiting for the morning to set in, I explored the underground desert. We mined down a ton of desert fossils, thanks to our excavator mod. We also need to defeat the Atlian enemies here for some mandibles. We got a magic conch from a desert chest, which can be quite handy for teleporting to the ocean biome. We also got a burnt sienna sword from a rare enemy drop. They've reworked this sword to be able to shoot sand projectiles. Then we return back to our base and sifted through all of our desert fossils using extractinator, getting some good ores and gems by doing so. To pass time, I also crafted a desert medallion on a demon altar. The sun has finally risen. And using the slime crown, we can summon King Slime, the first boss in this journey. I prefer fighting King Slime during the daytime more. It just feels more fitting and allows us to see his attacks more clearly. Our Murasama is able to deal quite a hefty blow against King Slime, despite only having 10 damage to its name. The range mode of Murasama helps to keep a safe distance. But let's just melee King Slime because we ain't no cowards. I wanted to test out the burn Sienna sword we got earlier, but I just made a mess from all the sand it shot out, so let's not use that. Back to using our reliable Murasama. The wide range of Murasama Slash was able to destroy the slime minions in little to no time. Needless to say, this King Slime boss fight was a breeze. I personally myself wouldn't call this a boss fight, as this felt like an absolute massacre. King Slime is now dead, and our Murasama just got slightly more powerful. Upon defeating King Slime, we must travel to the desert biome. We expand our arena here and proceed to summon the Desert Scourge. We were able to deal a lot of damage to Scorch as there was a lot of surface area that our Murasama could hit. But this guy keeps digging under the ground, so it was a tiny bit annoying to deal with. But aside from that one small slight 
issue, the fight was not a problem at all, and phase 2 wasn't hard in the slightest due to our mobility accessories. I'm not sure which mode deals more damage, the melee one or the range one, but it doesn't really matter too much, because in the end, we easily defeated Desert Scourge. Next, our objective is to defeat the Eye of Tuluhu. We have to be quick as it is already night time. I farm some lands from the floating eye enemies and turn them into suspicious looking eye. The night is almost over, but screw it, we'll be fine. Let's summon the Eye of Tuluhu. We must beat the eye before it turns daytime, so we have to be quick as there is not much time left. Fortunately, the eye was absurdly easy to deal with, as our damage has been increased from the two bosses we previously defeated. The wide range of our Murasama easily took care of the smaller eyes, so they were not an issue in the slightest, though his final phase was a bit troublesome, as he just won't stop moving and keeps dashing around, making it hard for me to hit him. But I just brute forced myself to not waste any more time, as it was almost morning, and I don't want the eye to despawn. So, by using brute force, we brutally violated the eye of Tuluhu. By defeating the eye of Tuluhu, we unlock the next upgrade for our Murasama. This upgrade allows us to perform a Rising Dragon Slash by pressing a special button and aiming it with right click. It deals a very solid damage and is a great way to perform mobility maneuvers. For our next mission, the Murasama gave us a command to fight the Eater of World. But before that, I crafted a full set of Victite armor first. I can't believe I'm getting ordered around by my own sword, how low I have become. I threw a bomb down to destroy the third shadow orb. I thought I was able to outrun the Eater and reach our arena in time. But let's just say things did not go according to plan. So let's just use the manual method instead, to not embarrass myself further. Surprisingly, Murasama is doing a terrible job at dealing damage against Eater of World. I cannot say the word world. I think it has something to do with the fact that Eater is a warm boss with multiple segments. So maybe the devs nerfed the Murasama to not deal insane damage against multiple segments, perhaps? I don't know exactly, but it is quite literally dealing one damage. That is horrible. Luckily, Murasama could bury Eater's projectiles, so it's not too hard to dodge them. Burn Sienna isn't a solution either. This word, despite being reworked, is still, quite frankly, dog water. Eater of Worlds was our first actual challenge in this journey, as all the bosses we fought so far were easy to deal with. It took me a lot of time to chip down Eater's health. Well, I'd be honest, I don't think this is hard, but it's just plain annoying. However, I did find a solution. Once we split the worm into two or more, they became much more fragile and easy to destroy. So the later parts of the fight were ironically much easier than the early stages. To put it into words, it is like a reverse phase 2. A quite interesting phenomenon. The fitting Eater of Worlds give us the materials we need to craft Nightmare Pickaxe and a full set of Shadow Armor. Our next objective is to defeat Skeletron located in the dungeon entrance. But since it was already morning, I decided to explore a bit of the jungle first, to spend some time and maybe get some useful stuff along the way, only to be rewarded with a dead man's chest that almost killed me. Luckily, I got a Feraclaw accessory from one of the IV chests. I also found a beehive biome. And you know what? While we are here, might as well fight Queen Bee. I was expecting to lose heart against Queen Bee, but I was in fact hardly losing against her. Our Murasama deals such good damage and the white slash insta kills all of her small bee minions, so this fight wasn't hard in the slightest. Needless to say, I did not regret breaking the Queen Bee Larva as this was probably the easiest boss fight yet so far in this journey. After defeating Queen Bee, I went home and made some more prison boxes. By using the conch, we could instantly teleport to the site of Ocean Biome near the dungeon. I am not dealing with any of the mobs here in the Sulfurous Sea Biome. Luckily, Murasama's Rising Dragon Slash helps us escape all the shenanigans. In the Sulfurous Sea Biome, I found a meteorite crater that landed much earlier. I couldn't refuse to not mine it down. Who knows, we might need it for later. While I was picking the meteorite ores up, two random Australian crocodiles decided to brutally slaughter me. Anyways, we arrive at the dungeon entrance. And let's say some swear words so that we could awaken the Skeletron inside of Chippy Gaming. Murasama's white slash was able to hit all of Skeletron segments at once. So this fight was a breeze. Skeletron is the perfect test subject for us to practice our Rising Dragon Slash. The funny thing is, every time we perform it, the skull head gets knocked away from us. I also noticed that us, the player, get some iframes every time we perform a Rising Dragon Slash. We just have to perform a Rising Dragon Slash to knock him away. So yeah, this entire fight was extremely easy. As we were about to enter the dungeon, we got an announcement that a goblin invasion is about to happen. But it's fine, that can come later. We beat up some dungeon enemies to get a golden key. We got some decent dungeon loot. But most importantly, we got the accessory that we were looking for, a cobalt shield. Now that we got the cobalt shield, we return back to our base and take care of the ongoing goblin invasion. We swiftly took care of it. But as to be expected, I don't know why the goblin invasion occurred so late for us. We head back to the corruption biome to engage a fight against the hive mine. We just need 
to defeat this disgusting blob so that we can get access to mining aerialite ores. Hive mine wasn't a problem in the slightest. We couldn't even get to experience the full power in each of his faces. Our combo was very powerful, it basically almost skipped an entire phase. And we took down the hive mine in no time. We got this sickest flamethrower from hive mine. Too bad, I'm going melee this playthrough. Now that the hive mine is down, we can mine down aerialite ores located in the sky islands. I mined down plenty of them. I turned them into bars and crafted all the rework aerialite team weapons, indicated by the red symbol. Windblade functions like normal, but now has a right click that shoots wind blast like a magic weapon. Gold plume spear shoots feathers from the tip, but the spear can be held using right click to rain down feathers from the sky. And the air spinner yo-yo becomes stronger with the ability to shoot more damaging feathers in six directions around it. Not to forget, we also crafted the aerospec armor. I built a helifator on top of zoologist. I am just doing her a favor by returning her back to her habitat. We mined down all the life crystals we encountered while dropping down from the helifator. And we also encountered a bone goblin tinkerer NPC. Now we have access to tinkerer workshop and rocket boots. I used the tinkerer workshop to upgrade my accessories. Our next objective is to defeat the slime god boss. I think we should give our aerialite weapons a shot instead of just using our Murasama. Give this play through some variety and spice so it's not too monotone. I died once to slime god because I was having a dilemma in my inner thoughts on whether I should do this playthrough with only Murasama or not. I decided not to because I already did a mono Murasama playthrough not long ago. But you guys can check my friend out called Mura which will do a mono rework Murasama playthrough soon. He's a great guy and he's been helping me a lot in guiding me throughout this entire playthrough. Gold Plume Spear Feather Rain lets us engage from a safe distance. And Air Spinner Yo-Yo is amazing at crowd controlling the smaller slimes that got split down after a slime god enters their later phases. Using the aerospec gears, we easily took down slime god, unlocking the next special ability of our Murasama. Now we can perform a plunging attack by using it. It might not be too useful for certain bosses, but it for sure is useful for mobility. Let's continue our elevator journey to arrive in the underworld biome. I grab a hellforge from down here. Our objective here is to mine down plenty of hellstones in order to craft molten gears. It took a while, but once I think I got more than enough, I returned back to base and crafted a full set of molten armor. I built a long platform in the underworld biome, and now I think we should be ready to face the wall of flesh. Murasama could hit all of wall of flesh segments at once, his mouth and two of his eyes. But that doesn't mean it's a good thing, because it looks like our damage is reduced if we hit all the parts at once. So let's just focus on the eyes. I don't understand why we unlock the plunging attack combo right before wall of flesh. Because how would I perform a plunging attack against wall of flesh when I have no ground to stand on and no way to hit them? Let's just say it was a bit too late when I realized that my arena was a tiny bit too small. My stubborn ass keeps refusing to make the arena bigger. But finally, after expanding the arena, wall of flesh became a breeze, and we perform a super sexy rising dragon slash combo as a finisher, ending pre-hard mode with style. From the wall of flesh, I got a loot magnet, which is a quite efficient tool for me to gather stuff. I consume the demon heart to gain an extra accessory slot. Our Murasama gave us a task to defeat either the mechanical bosses or aquatic scourge. But before that, let's break some demon altars first for some souls of night. I also explored the underground hollow for gelatin crystal. While exploring there, I found a bound wizard NPC. I bought the crystal ball from him. Once we got back home, we crafted all the summoning items for the mechanical bosses. But before fighting the mechanical bosses, let's fight Queen Slime first. She's not obligatory, but the crystal assassin armor set might be worth it. In the face of Murasama, Queen Slime is just basically glorified King Slime. As our damage was super solid, I died once to Queen Slime because I was unprepared and my armor was molten. But somehow, something snap inside of me. Suddenly, I was able to perform elusive combos that I never even thought of performing before. I don't know what just happened, but holy schmoly, that was very cool. I defeated one more queen slime and obtained the full crystal assassin armor set. This set grants us the ability to dash, so we don't have to use the shield of Tuluhu anymore. Then we went to the sky islands to farm down some wyverns in order to get souls of light. We used the souls to craft angel wings, our first wings in this playthrough. On that night, I decided to summon the twins first out of all the three mechanical bosses. I was curious about whether I will be performing optimal or not since Murasama is technically true melee and it's basically near impossible to defeat the twins via true melee in vanilla terraria. However, Murasama's rising dragon slash solves that problem as it performs as a gap closer in reaching the twins and the iframes it provides help the player negate the contact damage. The twins was the first boss fight I properly used a plunging attack on, though I do wish the plunging attack would provide a bit more iframes in the future update. Thanks to the iframes Murasama provided, we did not take too much damage from Spasmatism Flamethrower. I took Spasmatism down first because the Flamethrower can be quite distracting. Taking down Retinazer was a walk in the park. Two more mechanical bosses left
have to go. The night is not yet over, as after that, we immediately summon Skeletron Prime. Turns out you don't gain iframes during the Rising Dragon slash teleportation. Huh, that's something to keep in mind. I gotta say, Skeletron Prime is probably the easiest mech boss out of the three. Our Murasama was able to hit all the arms and head at once, but it isn't affected by the damage reduction. In fact, our Murasama basically one-shot at one of the arms for some reason. The craziest part is, I did not even have to destroy Skeletron Prime arms, as just by aiming his skull head is more than enough to take him down. Well, that was way too easy. How about Destroyer? This worm should be more of a challenge, right? Considering he is a worm boss, and so far, the Murasama is proving to be quite ineffective against worm bosses. Well, surprisingly, Destroyer wasn't too hard either, but definitely the tankiest out of the three. Well, there goes all of our NPCs. Ah, oh, this always happens, a familiar sight to behold. Unlike the experience we had with Eater, the worm boss damage reduction issue became less noticeable since we unlocked the Rising Dragon Slash. It deals super solid damage even on top of the damage reduction. Not to mention, the iframes it provides is the cherry on top of the cake, allowing us to be basically invulnerable as long as we don't get hit by the lasers. Destroyer is the perfect test subject for us to practice our plunging attack combo, because this worm prefers staying under the ground at all times. Reminds me of a game called Doodle Jump I used to play a lot on strangers' phones when I was a kid. You know the saying, you can run but you cannot hide yourself under the ground. I don't think that's how it goes, but we defeated the destroyer. We defeated a few more destroyers for some extra hollowed bars. It's a bit weird how we mine down the hard mode ores after defeating all the mechanical bosses, because you know, no, usually we do it before, not after. Using the hollowed bars, we crafted an Excalibur and a full set of hollowed armor. Then we made a few more prison boxes, because somehow all our housings are already occupied. I also upgraded the counter scarf we bought from the clothier NPC into an efficient scarf. And lastly, we upgraded our boots into an angel thread. I went to the brimstone crack biome to farm down some essence of half -walk. And while in there, I also mined down a few minority hellstones. We for sure need it for later. Using the essence, I crafted an of Desolation. But before fighting Calamitous Clone, and since it was already morning, I farmed down some ocean materials first and turned them into a seafood, because I'll be going to the Sulfur Sea first to test our damage against Aquatic Scourge, just for fun, and maybe it will increase our damage by a bit. Against this worm, I notice our damage isn't as insane as we dealt to the mechanical bosses. We are still powerful, but we can definitely start to notice the damage reduction. Being able to perform consecutive plunging attacks on Aquatic Scorch body was a fun experience too. And by doing that, I think we dealt a respectable amount of damage. Aquatic Scorch is the first boss fight that teaches us a lesson to not mess around with Rising Dragon Slash too much, as the cooldown between each Dragon Slash could easily be the end of us, especially due to all the floating hazards being spread out on the second phase. Nonetheless, even though we died a few times with a well-ordered Immaculate combos, we smoothly took down Aquatic Scourge. The Acid Rain event immediately started once we defeated Aquatic Scourge. Probably the most useless and boring event in Calamity. It was easy to deal with. Now that it is night time, we can proceed to summon the Calamitas Clone. Calamitas Clone teaches us the significance of mobility from our Rising Dragon Slash, and the importance of utilizing the iframes between each Dragon Slash to its maximum potential. We have to be really careful when approaching Cal Clone, especially when she summons her clone brothers during her later phases, as one of the brothers has the flamethrower ability that can deal high damage to us in close proximity. I am very used to the bullet hell phase, as I play too much Calamity. I don't think that is something I should be proud of though. Yep, I did not die even once. When using true melee, Cal clone has the same issue as the twins, as she will always try to distance herself away from us. So, in order to damage her, the best option for us would be to use our Rising Dragon Slash. In other words, she is basically a stronger and glorified version of the twins. I gotta say, Hollowed Armor Set Bonus does work really well with Murasama. The reason is, the iframes given by both are stacked on top of each other, so the synergy makes the gameplay very smooth. And at last, with a precise Dragon Slash combo, we successfully defeated the Calamitas Clone. The Operator NPC now sells an item that basically allows us to control the time and weather. Well, that is very useful. I also crafted the Brimstone Weapons that receive a rework. Brimlash shoots bolts that explode into three smaller ones at maximum distance of travel, and now has a right-click function that performs similarly like Relic of Ruin magic weapon. While for the Brimstone Sword, hitting enemies will sometimes spawn damaging Brimstone Geysers from the ground. Next, our 
objective would be to go to the underground jungle to find a plantera bulb. Along the way, we found a few life roots. After a while, we found the infernum generated plantera bulb nest structure. It is strategically located near the jungle temple too. This is one of the reasons why I love modded world generation. We destroy one of the many bulbs here to summon plantera. I was too lazy to build a proper arena, as I believe this nest structure alone contains more than enough space for us to maneuver around. Besides, come on, it's just plantera. We just have to circle around her to avoid most of her attacks while dealing a super solid damage against her. Her second phase wasn't a problem either, because the circling method still works perfectly fine. She did not even get a chance to scratch me. Damn, she is freaky with those teeths. I am not into biting though, sorry ma'am. I much prefer plantera when she closes her mouth. I am a respectable man. After defeating plantera, we must enter the jungle temple. Exploring the temple wasn't too hard because our Murasama's wide range easily took down all the temple enemies. We made a quick platform arena and proceed to summon Golem himself. The fight against Golem was pretty much boring. His laser projectiles move way too slow. That performing a chain of rising dragon slash could dodge them very easily. For most parts of the fight, we just have to stay on top of him on our arena platform, allowing us to deal damage comfortably while he could not even reach us. And there we go, Golem is now dead. From the treasure bag, we got a pig sow, and we also got the Aegis Blade. This sword got reworked by the Calamity Overhaul mod. Now it has the ability to charge and summon a giant sword to impel enemies from above. After that, our Murasama gave us a command to fight either Plaguebringer Goliath or Astrum Deus. I decided to go to the Astral Infection Biome first and farm the enemies there, so that we could get a Titan Heart, in which we can use to summon Astrum Deus. I tried using the Aegis Blade against Astrum Deus because I believe our Murasama would not be too effective against him, considering he is a warm boss. And so far, Murasama has proven to be ineffective against warm bosses. One thing I gotta say is holy schmoly, this boss is tanky as hell. I might be doing something wrong here, so maybe let's upgrade our stuff first. I bought the steampunk wings from the steampunker NPC. Then I went to the underground jungle again to mine down plenty of chlorophyte ores. And to defeat the plague bringer enemies here to obtain some plague cell canisters. We turned the chlorophyte into an armor set and upgraded it into the beetle armor. We crafted a defensive version. I thought having the beetle armor and steampunk wings was more than enough preparation for us to face the astrum deus once again. But to my surprise, our damage was still as pathetic as ever. Aegis blade is taking an absurdly long time in chipping down astrum deus HP. HP, and our Murasama is quite literally dog water against him. We are practically swinging around a wet noodle. The fight isn't too easy either, us taking 2 hits from the worm pretty much obliterates us instantly. After dying like 5 more times, I just knew we were definitely not ready yet for Astrum Deus. So we should fight other bosses first. I bought and consumed the maximum amount of life roots from the Jeweler NPC. Then using the Plague Cell Canisters, we crafted the Abomination, which we use in the underground jungle to summon Plague Bringer Goliath. I am still using the Plantera Arena, because who needs an arena when you have modded world generation? Another excuse to be lazy, fighting Goliath feels like an all-around charge and dash fiesta, because we have to commit to using Rising Dragon Slash the same time Goliath uses his dashing attack, with the iframes helping us to negate the contact damage. If we don't commit to dashing at the right time, we pretty much get obliterated by Goliath, so we have to be confident and quick at using our dashes. It is pretty much a test of our reflexes. Then I realized, hey, this boss AI kinda reminds me of Plantera, why don't we just try to circle him? Maybe it could work. And to my surprise, it worked near perfectly, especially combined with the dash from Rising Dragon Slash. Welp, I guess another day, another Terraria boss that falls victim to the circling method. To be fair, our Murasama already got the upgrade it needed by beating down Plague Bringer Goliath. But don't worry, we'll still have our revenge on Astrum Deus later. But for now, I'm very sure we are not ready to face him yet. However, I have a plan, a diffuse little plan to conquer them all. First, we must go to the Sunken Sea to find a giant clam. This is truly the clam before the storm, as we beat the clam to pulp so that the seeking NPC can spawn in. Because from him, we can buy a travel worm. Now we head to the ocean and use the truffle worm to summon Duke Fishron. We need to beat this harampic abomination to get Fishron wings. Duke Fishron wasn't hurt in the slightest, because we maneuver slightly faster than him. Rising Dragon Slash could easily destroy all the bubbles this pig spews out, so our only problem is avoiding his dashes. Which wasn't too much of a problem either, because we can just use the same dashing method we used on Goliath earlier. In fact, Duke Fishron is so weak, I think we destroyed him in under 1 minute. We got the Fishron wings from the first Duke Fishron, but we need to defeat more for a special sword that he can drop. It is none other than the Briny Baron. It got reworked by the Calamity Overhaul mod to be more powerful. I think they also buffed its right click to be a bit more powerful. While testing this sword, a Martian probe spawned out of nowhere. Lucky for us, we can initiate a Martian Invasion due to that. Using the Brani Baron, we easily took care of the Martian Invasion. Except until the Saucer spawned in. Yeah. 
Now that we have the fish on wings and briny baron, I think we are ready to fight the Astrum Deus again. Don't get me wrong, Astrum Deus is still tanky as hell, even with our briny baron, but it is definitely more manageable, and our fish on wings do help a lot in improving our mobility. On his face too, Astrum Deus can split into two separate worms. I thought they'd be less tanky, but hell nah, they literally have the same defense as the previous phase. Imagine this, a bullet hell spamming worm, but you multiply it by two. Let's just say it was not an enjoyable experience. But the constant tornado from Brainy Baron and the consistent DPS by the Razor Blade Typhoon from its right click mode does help a lot during this fight, as we can slowly but consistently deal a solid amount of damage to Astrum Deus' body. Our efforts were proven to be quite successful in taking down Calamity's other, other, other space worm. Astrum Deus dropped its hide, a very powerful true melee accessory, so turns out all our efforts were not a waste after all. After that, we went to the dungeon to fight the Lunatic Cultist. They genuinely feel like a normal mob due to how powerful the current state of our Murasama is. We don't even have to bother finding the real cultist clone, because it took a total of like 5 proper dragon slash to take them down. They seriously need to buff these guys. Next, we would have to take down the pillars. I decided to take down the solar one first, which was very easy to take care of. A bit weird considering Solar is usually the hardest one in vanilla based game. It is quite funny that our Murasama can knock up the pillars. Turns out they are not immune to knockback. The enemies drop Melt Blob, which we can use to craft Entropic Claymore, a rework melee weapon. It has a cool swing animation, but it's kinda trashy. Before fighting the other pillars, let's head to the dungeon first to farm down some ectoplasms. Just in case we need them for later, we turn a few of the ectoplasms into Comet Quasher. They rework this world by removing the true melee status of it, allowing it to rain down meteors without the requirements of having it to hit enemies on contact. And we also upgraded our shield into the Asgard's Valor. Then we took down the three other pillars, which wasn't too hard either. Stardust Pillar was the last one. And from my experience, Calamity summons Moon Lord almost instantaneously the moment you beat the last pillar. Aha, they cannot catch me off guard anymore. I have learned from my mistakes. Little to my knowledge, I was still underprepared, as Moon Lord's damage was much higher than I expected, and my mental was not ready to receive Moon Lord's spanking. Our first try was an embarrassing failure. We proceed to craft the Celestial Sigil, so we can summon the Moon Lord again. Rising Dragon Slash iframes were the most important aspect in this fight, as Moon Lord spawns a constant stream of projectiles, whether it be his Death Ray Beam, his Laser Blast, or the Cancer Tuluhu Eyes. Moon Lord never fails to fill me up with his beams. So, we have to be quick and confident at using our dashes. It'd be a death wish if we decided to just go kamikaze and throw melee moon lord without utilizing the iframes from our rising dragon slash. On some tries, I admit, I was not careful, and I received a few horrendous beatings from Mr. Moon Lord. Though moon lord's attacks do deal quite a heavy blow to our health bar, he was not tanky at all, unlike our previous annoying space worm boss. Imagine this tentacle eldritch abomination as a glass cannon. They hit hard, but we, the player, also hit them hard. In fact, his defense was so low, a few rising dragon slash could easily take down his three eye segments in a single phase, opening his center heart without much problem. Once his center heart was open, the fight was practically already over, as we can easily dodge the death ray lasers with our dragon slash dash, ending the fight against Moon Lord in a stylish manner. Ah, Moon Lord's death animation is always super satisfying to watch. Don't worry, our journey is not yet over. This is Calamity, we are just two thirds into the game. As now, we have just entered the post Moon Lord stage. Using the Celestial Onion, we gain one more extra accessory slot. And we also obtain the best wings in Vanilla Terraria, Area, the Celestial Starboard. It is not the best wings in Calamity though. We crafted a Luminite tier pickaxe so we can mine down the planetoid up in the sky for more Luminites. Using the Luminites, we crafted a full set of solar armor. We also crafted the Stellar Striker. Looks like Calamity Overhaul removed its true melee status, as its new default swing shoots of projectiles. While I was testing out this world, we got transported into this weird dimension. At first, I had no idea what to do. I thought this was a special effect from our stellar striker. Turns out, we had to climb the stairs. Once at the top, we'll be greeted with the cutscene. Damn, am I tripping or what? Anyways, the new Great Sword of Judgment rework is not bad. The new spiraling attack it unleashes is quite beautiful. 
To upgrade our Murasama and unlock its last combo pattern, we need to defeat either the Bumble Burp or the Profane Meatballs. I farm the enemies in the underworld biome for some unholy essence. Then I use them to craft the Profane Shard. Now we must go to the right side of the underworld to visit the Profane Garden biome. On the Crystal Altar, we summon the Profane Meatballs. And gonna lie, I got pretty overwhelmed by all the visual effects from the Profane Guardians. The fight wasn't as easy as I anticipated. So let's just fight the Bumble Burp first. I figured out he'd be easier. This way, we can unlock the final combo upgrade to our Murasama as soon as possible. Dragon Volley fight was extremely easy. I think I almost no hit at this boss. We are able to outmaneuver this bird with our current gears. But one thing I did not expect is we take damage if we dash through his red electric pillar. I'll make sure to keep that in mind. But yeah, aside from that, we styled on the bird. And the fight was pretty much over in under a minute. We have just unlocked the final combo to our Murasama. It is none other than Virgil's signature screen shattering judgment cut. While it may be extremely powerful, we need to do 10 rising dragon slashes in order to activate it. So it is actually perfectly balanced. Okay, a bit of fourth wall break here, but I know this is neither Sam's nor Murasama's signature ability. It belongs to Virgil and his Yamato. But you gotta admit, it does look cool. And a bit of easter egg here, if you name your player Virgil, your Murasama turns blue. Thanks Mura for letting me know this. On our fight against the Profane Meatballs, I honestly do not know what's happening on most parts of the fight. But I just spam Rising Dragon Slashes, giving us just enough iframes to be invulnerable to most of the bullet hell spams and charges. Well, I guess you could say I pretty much did the same strategy on most bosses. But it is definitely more prevalent on these flaming hot meatballs. And in the end, our judgment cut was able to deal the finishing blow. They drop the War Banner of the Sun, which is a very useful true melee accessory. Upon defeating them, the gate to enter Providence Arena will be unlocked. And on the center of the arena, we can use the Profane Core to summon Providence, the Profane Goddess. The main problem we are facing during the Providence fight is our wing flight time. Due to the sheer size of the arena, we can easily dodge Providence attacks. But at the same time, we can also easily run out of our flight time. As maneuvering and dashing around with Rising Dragon Slash could easily deplete our flight meter. While it does make dodging Providence bullet hell easier, we have to be more careful this way. I died quite some time fighting Providence. I think I was a bit tired from the gym when I fought her, because usually my performance performance is not as bad as this. She is literally my favorite Calamity boss. I tried fighting Nighttime Providence too at some point, but she was a big no-no. Though she looks cooler, the Nighttime version easily kills us with just two attacks. I am not doing that. But yeah, aside from the wing flight time issue, the fight wasn't that hard. Judgment Cut was very effective at dealing damage to Providence. Looks like the new Murasama upgrade is not just for show. Though we are required to do 10 dragon slashes every time we want to do it, it did help a lot in taking down Providence. She dropped some nice loots, especially the Elysian Aegis. While we are here, let's use the Rune of Cost drop by Providence to summon Cygnus, the Envoy of Devourer. This guy is one of Devourer's Sentinel, and he is basically an edge lord that watches too much Naruto. His main attacks primarily consist of dashing and charging around like a shadow. Sadly, he was not challenging in the slightest. A few rising dragon slashes and he was down. Oh well, back to our base now. By defeating Providence, we are now able to mine the Ueli Bloom Ore spawned in the underground biome. We crafted it into a Blossom Pickaxe and also a new sword added by Calamity Overhaul. It is called the Dragon Scale Great Sword. The good thing about this sword is it's very cheap to craft, considering this tier, and a great substitute for Terra Tomer. Not to forget, a full set of Tarragon Armor. I was feeling a little bit silly, so I crafted the Terra Blade and I turned it into the Terra Tomer. It took me quite some time, but I just wanted to see what could rework with the sword. Did they make it look cooler? I don't Nothing much changed, no? I might be tripping. It is time to fight the rest of the Sentinels. Let's first start with the Storm Weaver. I'm going to be using my Teratomer here and there, just to make sure my time crafting it didn't go to waste. Since we did not build an arena, this fight feels like the ultimate test of the circling method. One wrong circular move and we are dead. I think the reason is because of the space gravitational pull. I should have bought a gravity normalizer potion, now that I think about it. So yeah, I can't play around too much with this worm, sadly. In Storm Weaver's phase 2, the worm starts raining down projectiles like Blizzard, Tornadoes, and Lightning. But honestly, the moment he turned to phase 2, his HP was already very low, so it did not take very long for us to defeat Storm Weaver. The Worm dropped this gun called the Storm Dragoon. Calamity Overhaul reworked this gun by adding recoil to it and making it significantly more powerful. If you shoot the gun on the ground, you can basically have infinite flight, just like in Jetpack Joyride. 
Now we must go inside the dungeon to fight Sislas Void, the last of the three sentinels. Sislas was the perfect fight I was waiting and looking for to test the true potential of our Murasama, because he has tons of stuff lying around, so that our Rising Dragon Slash could easily be activated. Therefore, we could do tons of judgment cut, so we are basically invincible as long as we spam the Rising Dragon Slash. I did so much judgment cut during the fight against Sislas. You can't blame me though. It looks very cool. You would do the same. I definitely did not die at all during this fight. Yup. Yeah, our only issue was his final phase, where he starts becoming a black hole and pull us, the player, into him. Weirdly enough, at some point, our Murasama was powerful enough that we bypassed through his black hole phase completely, defeating Sislas the way it is not intended to be. I am 100% sure this is a bug. Now that all the sentinels are down, let's craft the cosmic worm, as it is time to summon none other than the Forer of Gods. I know this version of Murasama is kinda bad against worm bosses, but just to pay respect to it, and so the video title makes sense, we're going to be using it against the Forer. Immediately, we can notice I am struggling really bad in fighting the Forer. Yeah, we are definitely not ready yet to fight the Forer. I think we should upgrade our mobility accessory a bit. First, we buy a prismatic lace wing from the point shop mod. Then I went to the hallowed biome to summon and beat down the Empress of Light. We need to beat her for the Soaring Insignia accessory she can drop. Oh no, she is doing that weird lighting bug again. Does anyone know the fix to this? It's been occurring to me for a while now. But eh, it only took us a few seconds to beat her anyway. I try testing my ability versus Daytime Empress of Light. But nah, she is definitely too easy. Mm hmm Yeah, no. Then I went to the dungeon again, to beat down plenty of phantom spirits, so we can summon Poltergast. This is also a great way to farm Polterplasms. After defeating 30 phantom spirits, Poltergast will spawn in. When you see Poltergast, what does he remind you of? That's right, Blue Plantera, because this spider is basically Plantera. So the same strategy we applied on Plantera can also be applied to him. Truly, pick boss design. Once Poltergast reaches phase 2, he will start separating himself into two, a shadow clone version and himself. But if anything, that just helps us to hit them easier, therefore getting more iframes and becoming near invincible. I am grateful this is not Inferno mode, because Inferno Poltergast inflicts me with severe PTSD. Like legit, that boss is not made to be fought by humans. Which is ironic, because default Poltergast is probably one of the easiest bosses to fight in Calamity. Poltergast drops some good weapons that could rework by Calamity Overhaul, like the Terror Blade or the Banshee Hook. They're cool, but I don't think I will be using them too often. We upgraded our Soaring Insignia to Ascendant Insignia. I think we are now ready again to fight the Vodar. Yeah, I can definitely notice the effects of Ascendant Insignia coming into place. Calamity nerfs Soaring Insignia Infinite Flight, but they added it as an ability with a cooldown on Ascendant Insignia. Now it is much easier to maneuver around in the air. I think we are a bit faster than the Vodar too, so that's a very good thing. In this fight, mobility is more important than defense, as one hit from the Vodar's head pops us easily like a balloon, even with high defense. So the return on investment is not that good. Oh hell yeah, some fancy words right there. I've been learning English. After all those years, all those comments finally got onto me. I'm gonna start my redemption arc. I'm not a Mexican or a Russian, what the hell? Anyways, I got a bit off topic there. Yeah, the Forer. Mm -hmm. As long as we don't get too cocky or overconfident like doing too much style or stuff like that, we should be fine. Phase 2 wasn't a problem either. Nice transition animation by the way, I love that. Because just look at how smooth and buttery my dodges are. This is peak calamity player performance right here. Hmm, now that I think about it, I don't think that's a compliment nor an achievement. I take that back. I don't wanna be a virgin for life. Well, I did make a few stupid decisions here and there. But honestly, could you blame me? The Murasama is just too fun to play with. Okay, I got a lock in. Now that I watch my clips back, we had a near-death experience near the end. My arse almost got eaten by the space worm. And at last, we used the judgment cut as a final blow to finish the Forer off. That was super satisfying to do. We defeat another Devourer 2 after that, for more materials and the Excelsus Sword that could rework. The Solar Eclipse immediately started the day after we defeated Devourer of Gods, which was the perfect opportunity for us to farm some Dark Sun Fragments. And then out of nowhere, when I was sorting my inventory, a huge meatball fell from the sky. Turns out it was just our friendly neighborhood French person, Noxus.
The next day, I bought pumpkin seeds from the dried NPC, then I planted them so we can craft the summoning item for the invasion events. I farmed the frost moon for endothermic energy while also testing our Excelsus, and the pumpkin moon for nightmare fuel. They seriously need to rework these events, these are way too easy right now. Once we get the materials, we crafted plenty of ascendant spirit essence, a core material to craft important items such as cosmic anvil. We upgrade our shield into the Asgardian Aegis, and crafted a full set of the God Slayer armor. This armor gives us the ability to perform a God Slayer dash. Though it has a cooldown, it can be a devastating combo if used correctly. Then we with Providence at a hallowed biome for her Elysian wings, which we can combine with our current boots to craft an Elysian tracers. We also crafted the Devourer of Gods themed weapons, but none of them really caught my eye. They were cool, but our Murasama's way cooler. After that, we craft the Blast Dragon Egg, so we can use it to summon Yaron the Jungle Dragon. Fighting Yaron is like playing hide and seek, except we are doing both at the same time. We hide from Yaron to avoid his deadly dashes, but we also seek Yaron to hit him, because this bird just keeps disappearing out of our sight. Does this bird have ADHD or something? Damn bruh, stop moving! Not to mention the insane amount of damage this bird can deal. Luckily, Rising Dragon Slash gives us the ability to quickly maneuver around in the air, so we can slip through the Blazing Bullet Hell Fiesta and charges. And the God Slayer Dash combo we can perform once in a while can be a lifesaver, while also making us appear very cool. As long as we don't hit the Flame Nados, because those are guaranteed instant death. I was wondering, which Calamity boss would be edible and is the most delicious? Yaron would definitely be triple S tier. Those massive wings would make a godly chicken wings, covered with hot sauce. The bones could be used for broth, and the rest of the meat can be used for chicken roast, or grinded into chicken nuggets. I'm a chef, so tell me in the comment section, if I should do a video on how I would cook Terraria bosses and turn them into dishes, because the fish run is looking plenty delicious. Anyways, we got a bit off track there, but yeah, Yaron. Yaron is hard, and I hate this bird with a fiery passion. I hope they rework this boss soon. This bird truly tests my patience with how we can only properly damage him in certain attack patterns. But in the end, eventually, we were disciplined enough to be able to beat Yaron. On his death, he dropped so many chicken nuggets. That's awesome. The bird dropped this pole arm called the Dragon Rage. They rework it a bit by adding a secondary attack mode. I am not quite sure what it does, but it spins. After that, we combine Teratomer with Excelsus to craft Divine Source Blade, a newly added endgame sword by Calamity Overhaul, basically their version of Zenith. It is very solid, simple, and cool. There is nothing too overwhelming or insane about it. Now that we have access to Auric Bars, we also crafted the Zenith. It had a red symbol on it, so I thought it got rework. But I don't think much changed, no? The swords in the attack animation are still the same. Do tell me if I'm wrong though. Then I upgrade my boots into the Seraph Tracers. And last but not least, we craft a full set of Auric Tesla armor. Oh, and also the Tyrannis and Sniper Rifle. Just for fun, Tyrannis and Sniper Rifle probably got one of the most insane reworks in this mod. They added a reload mechanic, which sounds and feels satisfying to use. And the massive recoil is funny too. I very much like this gun. Let's test our arsenal of weaponries against a few bosses before our final encounter. Brimstone Elemental? Those huge pair of personalities won't get you a real job. Cryogen? I see come, I see go. Nice cock! Ravager, scream away your pain, but you're just a copy of Golem. Leviathan, it's not about the size that matters, it's about how you use it. Ah, one-shotting bosses once in a while always feels nice. Anyways, snap back to reality. I crafted the Altar of the Accursed. As now, it is time to summon the final boss of Calamity. It is none other than the one and only Supreme Calamitas. Fortunately, I'm quite accustomed to dodging the bullet hells that spawn before each phase. Most likely due to all my experience playing Infernum beforehand. Murasama does an excellent job at clearing the Brimstone Hearts. One thing I gotta say, Murasama's mobility movements help a lot during this entire fight, especially in slipping through the cracks and crevices of the bullet hell. I can't imagine fighting Supreme Calamitas with just a default nerf through melee Murasama. That would be a nightmare. I am quite reckless when it comes to dodging her primary brimstone blast. Before I started the fight against Eskal, I already knew I was going to die a lot in this battle. The moment Calamita summons her two brothers, I was scared for a second. But out of nowhere, my ultra instinct got activated. My eyes suddenly became awakened. I dodged them projectiles like hot knife through butter. But the moment one of the two brothers died, I underestimated them. So the remaining brother bombarded me with his projectiles. I shouldn't have done that. I just kept spamming Rising Dragon Slash during most parts of this fight. 
Look, I was panicking, and it kinda works. If it works, it works. We finally made it this far. We must stay focused, my brothers, for we must not disappoint our ancestors. Our ancestors died in war, not for us to be defeated by an emo woman with chronic depression. We were able to outspeed the giant meatballs on escalator faces, and we slipped through the crevices of the bullet hell like a Romanian when there is a wallet drop on the floor. Again, I am very grateful this is not Inferno mode, because Inferno Escal has a desperation phase that is extremely hard, and also the reason why my Inferno gun the full movie hasn't been uploaded yet. I swear, it will be really soon, okay? But yeah, the Vought Eskal Desperation phase is basically just a combination of all her previous attacks, which were not too much of a problem to handle. As long as we pay proper attention, we should be fine. And there we go, Supreme Calamitas has now been defeated. You might be thinking, damn, this video is over. Nope, we still have two more final bosses. We open the Supreme Calamitas treasure bag, but we're unable to craft the endgame stuff yet, as we need to defeat the Dragon Exomex first for that to happen. So here we are now, summoning the mechanical bosses. I noticed starting the battle with Ares was the easiest, as we basically one-shot it for some reason. Probably some spaghetti code right there. Thanatos was the most troublesome, as his attacks can wombo combo obliterate us easily. So we should keep him away from being the last one to be beaten. Yeah, you can basically adjust the order in which you fight the bosses, depending on which one you chose at the beginning and which one you beat first. It is a quite useful info to know from time to time. Dragon Exomax isn't my top priority, so I'm just gonna be using my trusty Tyrannis N instead of purely just Mura against them. There is nothing too interesting or insane that happened during the Dreadon fight. We were pretty consistent at dealing damage most of the time. Our time in Apollo was very easy, especially if we use our Divine Source Blade or Tyrannis N instead of our Murasama. Ares Desperation Phase before he truly dies looked the coolest, and is the easiest for me to handle, as I'm very used to it. Honestly, I love Ares design the most out of the three. My friend Bijo had to teach me how to properly dodge Tanato shenanigans. Turns out we have to be very close to the giant worm all the time. Who would have guessed that? His lasers do look amazing though, and gonna lie. But yeah, thanks Bijo. Using our Tyrannis and Sniper Rifle, we snapped the living hell out of Artemis and Apollo, successfully defeating the Dragon XO Max. They dropped the Dragon's Heart, a very powerful accessory that is a reference to Senator Armstrong. Alright, we have properly defeated all the required bosses. Now we're able to craft the Dragon's Forge and the summoning item for Noxus. As now it is time to summon the giant space meatball Noxus himself, the living embodiment of Black Hole. Maybe we shouldn't have summoned Noxus during daytime. This is very bright. I'm still going to be using my Murasama vs Noxus, just to see how far this high frequency blade can carry me throughout the whole game. Besides, what could possibly go wrong? During the early stages of the fight, Noxus was still kinda manageable, even though our Murasama is dealing below average undesirable damage, to the point that our triple Wham Slam combo barely put a dent onto Noxus health bar. That is a terrible indicator for what we're about to face. However, if we keep this consistency at chipping away his health bar, we should be fine. Even if the battle last for an extended period of time. But the moment he turned to phase 2, things started to take a turn. Noxus transforms into a completely different being, covering our entire screen with a dark cosmic background, and granting him access to more dangerous arsenal of attacks. Let's just say he is the predator and we are his prey. I got extremely overwhelmed by the fast rapid flurry of attacks. Even Murasama's rising dragon slash couldn't escape the meatballs wrath. Luckily, every time he used a summoning item, it starts the fight on his second phase, saving us a bit of time. I tried learning his attack patterns, but to no avail, because we are not dealing enough damage. To be fair, he's an endgame super boss, and we are technically still using post Yaron gears. Makes me wonder how strong the future Calamity super bosses are, like Yarim. It looks like we are not ready to fight Noxus yet. I died countless times. Our Murasama is doing really pathetic damage, and I'm very sure we are in desperate need to upgrade our gears. So I crafted some shadow spec bars, which I turn into the Demon Shade Armor. Demon Shade Armor has an ability that greatly increases our damage, but at the cost of greatly reducing our defense. Calamity Overhaul added this new crafting system mechanic like the one in Minecraft. Let's try to craft one of the endgame bows. This feels a bit surreal. This bow is called the Heavenfall Longbow. Apart from its cool sounding name, its DPS is mind-bogglingly insane. To be fair, it is expensive to craft. This isn't even the overpowered part yet. Once you shoot it for a while, it will generate a secondary charge, which we can use to annihilate enemies from existence. I am not even exaggerating, even the testing dummies are gone. You know what time it is? It is time for sweet sweet revenge. Noxus, come over here. 
Get a taste of your own medicine. With a single shot, we erase him from existence. Well, that's perfectly balanced. Noxus drops a few loots. But one of the most notable one is the Noxus Sprayer. Introducing the Go Away Spray. It's a spray that is able to erase any creatures or entity from existence. Say bye-bye to your problems in an instant. Is your ex-wife troubling you? Boom, bye-bye. Devourer of Gods? Well, devour these nuts. Say bye-bye to your cock. Oh my god, Providence, the goddess that holds the power of the sun is about to spawn. Oh no, what should we do now? Boom, gone into oblivion. So, what are you waiting for? Call 1999 Noxus and get your own go away spray now. Before we face our final challenge, we must dive down to the deepest depth of the abyss in search for Terminus. Before we're able to acquire it, we'll be stopped by the Edolon Worm. Little to the worm's knowledge, we have the strongest bow known to mankind, obliterating it without leaving a single trace behind. If anything, it's the worm's own fault for getting in our way of us acquiring Terminus. Upon defeating Noxus, we are granted access to enter the Garden of Eden. And once we step onto the grounds near the Tree of Revelation, we'll be forced to fight none other than Nimless Titi himself, a god and the true final boss of both Calamity and Troaria. Oh, and before we start, don't even try to use the Noxus Prayer against Nimless Deity. Just don't. He deflects the spray back at us. Moon Lord or Supreme Calamitas are nothing compared to this guy. This guy might just be the peak of more Terraria boss fight. Well, at least for now. Like I said before, during the fight against the Forer, about paying respect to Murasama, yes, I'm going to only be using Murasama against the true final boss. I'm gonna stay true with my mission. I ain't gonna break my promise, I'm a man of my word, and I'm gonna prove it. Even though there are plenty of other better end game weapon options, including our Heaven Fall Longbow, but what's the fun in that? Let's truly have a respectable and fair battle against the god of Terraria himself. Here is where the Demon Shade Armor special ability comes into place. Because the moment we activate the set bonus, every enemy around us turns red, and our Murasama deals significantly more damage to them, but at the cost of us being even more extremely fragile. A slight grease or scratch absolutely destroys our health bar. The very concept of Nameless Deity bends the rule of Terraria physics itself. These are no longer pixelated sprites, these are fucking 3D. This isn't just bending the rule anymore honestly, it is breaking the very concept of reality itself. The Terrarian has never seen a circle or 3D stuff before, so all this biblical stuff are very new to him. That is actually terrifying now that I think about it. Imagine this, you're a human, then out of nowhere, you are forced to see reality breaking phenomenons occurring upon your own very eyes against your own will. For example, like a 6 dimensional floating banana. I don't know how to make a proper scary example, but you get the idea. Huge props to the modders and devs that made this mod by the way, you all are insane. On DT second phase, he grabs the living hell out of our adrenaline and rage meter, and he proceeds to crush it into oblivion. That was badass, and gonna lie. As you guessed it, the real fight has just begun. We better say our prayers, but not to the wrong god. My adrenaline was pumping like crazy during this entire fight. Might as well ride a roller coaster at this point. Did you know the reason behind the huge sensor bar on his face? It is because humanity are unable to comprehend the sight of god, so our brain just blocks it out. He is larger than anything in Terraria, to signify that deity is greater than anything and everything. And his looks are ever changing. Because god appears in almost every religion, but each religion portrays them differently. Oh, and also, we are unable to kill him. We are just proving our worth here. Terraria modding truly has changed a lot, from a simple pixelated Lovecraftian eye into a literal censored god. The difficulty of this fight is nowhere near easy. Luckily, getting killed by him isn't a permadeath. By using the Terminus, we can access the Garden of Eden anytime at will. Permanent death would have been devastating. The moment we take his health low enough, he will enter his enraged phase, aka the hardest part of this entire fight. DT gains a whole new moveset of attacks that deals much more damage. Is that the Terraria main menu screen? That is both very cool and terrifying at the same time. This will easily convince vanilla players that this game is no longer Terraria. At this point, I don't know what is happening anymore. I can't put it into words, so just face your eyes upon this abomination of a creature. This shit is hard. I died so much during this part. We were so close yet so far. Damn, we are really breaking the fourth wall over here. I found out by using our Murasama's Rising Dragon Slash, we could easily circle deity around. This is probably the easiest way for us to dodge and survive the extremely dangerous Dark Death Ray Beam. It might look like an easy task, but my body was sweating like crazy. I was so scared of slipping up. But in the end, with pure luck and brute force, we eventually pulled through and reached Deity's final attack, which wasn't too hard, unlike the previous ones. And boom, we did it. We proved our worth.
Is it over? Were we successful in defeating God?